The lantern sits on a stump, rusted, grease-fouled, its cracked chimney smeared on one side with a soaring smudge of soot. It sheds a feeble and sultry glare upon the trestles and the boards and the adjacent earth. Upon the dark ground, the chips look like random smears of soft pale paint on a black canvas. The boards look like long, smooth tatters torn from the flat darkness and turned backside out. Cash labors about the trestles, moving back and forth, lifting and placing the planks with long, clattering reverberations in the dead air, as though he were lifting and dropping them at the bottom of an invisible well, the sounds ceasing without departing, as if any movement might dislodge them from the immediate air in reverberant repetition. He saws again, his elbow flashing slowly, a thin thread of fire running along the edge of the saw, lost and recovered at the top and bottom of each stroke in unbroken elongation, so that the saw appears to be six feet long, into and out of Pa's shabby and aimless silhouette. Give me that plank. No, the other one. He puts the saw down and comes and picks up the plank he wants, sweeping Pa away with the long swinging gleam of the balanced board. The air smells like sulfur. Upon the impalpable plane of it, their shadows form as upon a wall, as though like sound they had not gone very far away in falling, but had merely congealed for a moment, immediate and musing. Cash works on, half turned into the feeble light, one thigh and one pole-thin arm braced, his face sloped into the light with a rapt, dynamic immobility above his tireless elbow. Below the sky, sheet lightning slumbers lightly. Against it, the trees, motionless, are ruffled out to the last twig, swollen, increased as though quick with young. It begins to rain. The first harsh, sparse, swift drops rush through the leaves and across the ground in a long sigh, as though of relief from intolerable suspense. They are big as buckshot, warm as though fired from a gun. They sweep across the lantern in a vicious hissing. Pa lifts his face, slack-mouthed, the wet black rim of snuff plastered close along the base of his gums. From behind his slack-faced astonishment, he muses as though from beyond time upon the ultimate outrage. Cash looks once at the sky, then at the lantern. The saw has not faltered, the running gleam of its pistoning edge unbroken. Get something to cover the lantern. Pa goes to the house. The rain rushes suddenly down, without thunder, without warning of any sort. He is swept onto the porch upon the edge of it, and in an instant Cash is wet to the skin. Yet the motion of the saw has not faltered, as though it and the arm functioned in a tranquil conviction that rain was an illusion of the mind. Then he puts down the saw and goes and crouches above the lantern, shielding it with his body, his back shaped lean and scrawny by his wet shirt as though he had been abruptly turned wrong, side out, shirt and all. Pa returns. He is wearing Jules' raincoat and carrying Dewey Dells. Squatting over the lantern, Cash reaches back and picks up four sticks and drives them into the earth and takes Dewey Dell's raincoat from Pei and spreads it over the sticks, forming a roof above the lantern. Pa watches him. I don't know what you'll do. Darl taking his coat with him. Get wet. He takes up the saw again. Again it moves up and down, in and out of that unhurried imperviousness as a piston moves in the oil, soaked, scrawny, tireless, with the lean light body of a boy or an old man. Pa watches him, blinking his, face streaming. Again he looks up at the sky with that expression of dumb and brooding outrage and yet of vindication, as though he had expected no less. Now and then he stirs, moves, gaunt and streaming, picking up a board or a tool and then laying it down. Vernon Tull is there now, and Cash is wearing Mrs. Tull's raincoat, and he and Vernon are hunting the saw. After a while, they find it in Pa's hand. Why don't you go on to the house, out of the rain? Pa looks at him, his face streaming slowly. It is as though upon a face carved by a savage caricaturist, a monstrous burlesque of all bereavement flowed. You go on in. Me and Vernon can finish it. Pa looks at Item. The sleeves of Jules' coat are too short for him. Upon his face, the rain streams, slow as cold glycerin. I don't begrudge you the wedding. He moves again and falls to shifting the planks, picking them up, laying them down again carefully, as though they are glass. He goes to the lantern and pulls at the propped raincoat until he knocks it down and cash conies and fixes it back. You get onto the house. 
He leads Pa to the house and returns with the raincoat and folds it and places it beneath the shelter where the lantern sits. Vernon has not stopped. He looks up, still sawing. You ought to done that at first. You know it was fixing to rain. It's his fever. He looks at the board. Aye. He'd have come anyway. Cash squints at the board. On the long flank of it, the rain crashes steadily, myriad, fluctuant. I'm going to bevel it. It'll take more time. Cash sets the plank on edge. A moment longer, Vernon watches him. Then he hands him the plane. Vernon holds the board steady while Cash bevels the edge of it with the tedious and minute care of a jeweler. Mrs. Tull comes to the edge of the porch and calls Vernon. How near are you done? Vernon does not look up. Not long. Some, yet. She watches Cash stooping at the plank, the turgid, savage gleam of the lantern slicking on the raincoat as he moves. You go down and get some planks off the barn and finish it, and come in out of the rain, you'll both catch your death. Vernon does not move. Vernon! We won't be long. We'll be done after a spell. Mrs. Tull watches them a while. Then she re-enters the house. If we get in a tight, we could take some of them planks. I'll help you put them back. Cash ceases the plane and squints along the plank, wiping it with his palm. Give me the next one. Sometime toward dawn, the rain ceases. But it is not yet day when Cash drives the last nail and stands stiffly up and looks down at the finished coffin, the others watching him. In the lantern light, his face is calm, musing. Slowly, he strokes his hands on his rain-coated thighs in a gesture deliberate, final, and composed. Then the four of them, Cash and Pa and Vernon and Peabody, raise the coffin to their shoulders and turn toward the house. It is light, yet they move slowly, empty, yet they carry it carefully, lifeless, yet they move with hushed precautionary words to one another, speaking of it as though complete, it now slumbered lightly alive, waiting to come awake. On the dark floor their feet clump awkwardly, as though for a long time they have not walked on floors. They set it down by the bed. Peabody says quietly, Let's eat a snack. It's almost daylight. Where's Cash? He has returned to the trestles, stooped again in the lantern's feeble glare, as he gathers up his tools and wipes them on a cloth carefully and puts them into the box with its leather sling to go over the shoulder. Then he takes up box, lantern, and raincoat and returns to the house, mounting the steps into faint silhouette against the paling east. In a strange room, you must empty yourself for sleep. And before you are emptied for sleep, what are you? And when you are emptied for sleep, you are not. And when you're filled with sleep, you never were. I don't know what I am. I don't know if I am or not. Jewel knows he is, because he does not know that he does not know whether he is or not. He cannot empty himself for sleep because he is not what he is and he is what he is not. Beyond the unlamped wall, I can hear the rain shaping the wagon that is ours. The load that is no longer theirs that felled and sought it, nor yet theirs that bought it, and which is not ours either, lie on our wagon though it does, since only the wind and the rain shape it only to Jewel and me that are not asleep. And since sleep is is not, and rain and wind are was, it is not. Yet the wagon is, because when the wagon is was, Addie Bundren will not be. And Jewel is so Addie Bundren must be, and then I must be, or I could not empty myself for sleep in a strange room. And so if I am not emptied yet, I am is. How often have I lain beneath rain on a strange roof, thinking of home. I made it on the bevel. One, there is more surface for the nails to grip. Two, there is twice the gripping surface to each seam. Three. The water will have to seep into it on a slant. Water moves easiest up. And down or straight across. Four, in a house people are upright two-thirds of the time. So the seams and joints are made up and down. Because the stress is up and down. Five, in a bed where people lie down all the time, the joints and seams are made sideways because the stress is sideways. Six, except. Seven, a body is not square like a cross die. Eight, animal magnetism. Nine, 
The animal magnetism of a dead body makes the stress come slanting, so... The seams and joints of a coffin are made on the bevel. 10. You can see by an old grave that the earth sinks down on the bevel. 1-1. One, one. While in a natural hole it sinks by the center, the stress being you panned. Down. 12. So I made it on the bevel. 13. It makes a neater job. My mother is a fish. It was 10 o'clock when I got back, with Peabody's team hitched on to the back of the wagon. They had already dragged the buckboard back from where Quick found it upside down straddle of the ditch about a mile from the spring. It was pulled out of the road at the spring, and about a dozen wagons was already there. It was Quick found it. He said the rive was up and still rising. He said it had already covered the highest watermark on the bridge piling he ever seen. That bridge won't stand a whole lot water I said. Has somebody told Aunts about it? I told him. He says he reckons the boys has heard and unloaded and are on the way by now. He says they can load up and get across. He better go on and bury her at New Hope. That bridge is old. I wouldn't monkey with it. His mind is set on taking her to Jefferson. Then he better get at it soon as he can. Aunts meets us at the door. He has shaved, but not good. There is a long cut on his jaw, and he is wearing his Sunday pants and a white shirt with a neckband buttoned. It is drawn smooth over his hump, making it look bigger than ever, like a white shirt will, and his face is different too. He looks folks in the eye now, dignified, his face tragic and composed, shaking us by the hand as we walk up onto the porch and scrape our shoes, a little stiff in our Sunday clothes, our Sunday clothes rustling, not looking full at him as he meets us. The Lord giveth, the Lord giveth, we say. The Lord giveth. That boy is not there. Peabody told about how he come into the kitchen, hollering, swarming and clawing at Cora when he found her cooking that fish, and how Dewey Dell taken him down to the barn. My team all right? All right I tell him. I give them a bait this morning. Your buggy seems all right too. It ain't hurt. And no fault of somebody's. I'd give a nickel to know where that boy was when that team broke away. If it's broke anywhere, I'll fix it I say. The women folks go on into the house. We can hear them, talking and fanning. The fans go wish. Wish. Wish and them talking, the talking sounding kind of like bees murmuring in a water bucket. The men stop on the porch, talking some, not looking at one another. Howdy Vernon. Howdy tall. Looks like more rain. It does for a fact. Yes sir. It will rain some more. It come up quick. And going away slow. It don't fail. I go around to the back. Cash is filling up the holes lie board in the top of it. He is trimming out plugs for them, one at a time, the wood wet and hard to work. He could cut up a tin can and hide the holes and nobody wouldn't know the difference. Wouldn't mind, anyway. I have seen him spend the hour trimming out a wedge like it was glass he was working, when, he could have reached around and picked tip a dozen sticks and drove them into the joint and made it do. When we finished I go back to the front. The men have gone a little piece from the house, sitting on the ends of the boards and on the sawhorses where we made it last night, some sitting and some squatting, which feel they ain't come yet. They look up at me, their eyes asking. It's about, I say. He's ready to nail. While they are getting up Anz comes to file Claude and looks at us and we return to the porch. We scrape our shoes again, careful, waiting for one another to go in first, milling a little at the door. Anz stands inside the door, dignified, composed. He waves us in and leads the way into the room. They had laid her in it reversed. Cash made it clock shape, like this seam beveled and with every joint a scrub with the plane tight as a drum and neat as a sewing basket, and they had laid her in it head to foot so it wouldn't crush her dress. It was her wedding dress and it had a flare out bottom, and they had laid her head to foot in it so the dress could spread out, and they had made her a veil out of a mosquito bar so the auger holes in her face wouldn't show. 
when we are going out, with field comes. He is wet and muddy to the waist, coming in. The Lord comfort this house. I was late because the bridge has gone. I went down to the old ford and swum my horse over, the Lord protecting me. His grace be upon this house. We go back to the trestles and plank ends and sit or squat. I know it would go. It's been there a long time, that there bridge. The Lord has kept it there you mean. I don't know there's a man that's touched hammer to it in 25 years. How long has it been there Uncle Billy? It was built in, let me see. It was in the year 1888. I mind it because the first man to cross it was Peabody. Coming to my house when Jody was born. If I'd have crossed it every time your wife littered since, it'd have been wore out long before this, Billy. We laugh, suddenly loud, then suddenly quiet again. We look a little aside at one another. Lots of folks has crossed it that won't cross no more bridges. It's a fact. It's so. One more ain't, no ways. It had taken them two ta three days to got her to town in the wagon. They'd be gone a week, getting her to Jefferson and back. What sense so itching to take her to Jefferson for anyway? He promised her. She wanted it. She come from there. Her mind was set on it. And Anse is set on it, too. Aye. It's like a man that's let everything slide all his life to get set on something that will make the most trouble for everybody he knows. Well, it'll take the Lord to get her over that river now. Ants can't do it. And I reckon he will. He's took care of Ants a long time, now. It's a fact. Too long to quit now. I reckon he's like everybody else around here. He's done it so long now he can't quit. Cash comes out. He has put on a clean shirt, his hair wet, his comb smoothed down on his brow, smooth and black as if he had painted it onto his head. Squats stiffly among us, we watching him. You feeling this weather, ain't you? Cash says nothing. A broke bone always feels it. Fellow with a broke bone can tell it a coming. Lucky Cash got off with just a broke leg. He might have hurt himself bedrid. How far did you fall, Cash? Twenty-eight foot, four and a half inches, about. I move over beside him. A fellow can show slip quick on wet planks. It's too bad. But you couldn't to help it. It's them darn women. I made it to balance with her. I made it to her measure and weight. If it takes wet boards for folks to fall, it's fixing to be lots of falling before the spell is done. You couldn't have helped it I say. I don't mind the folks falling. It's the cotton and corn I mind. Neither does Peabody mind the folks falling. How about it, Doc? It's a fact. Washed clean out in the ground it will be. Seems like something is always happening to it. Course it does. That's why it's worth anything. If nothing didn't happen and everybody made a big crop, do you reckon it would be worth the raising? Well, I'd be darn if I like to see my work washed out in the ground, work I sweat over. It's a fact. A fellow wouldn't mind seeing it washed up if he could just turn on the rain himself. Who is that man can do that? Where is the color of his eyes? Aye. The Lord made it to grow. It's his'n to wash up if he sees it fitting so. You couldn't have helped it I say. It's them darn women. In the house the women begin to sing. We hear the first line commence, beginning to swell as they take hold, and we rise and move toward the door, taking off our hats and throwing our shoes away. We do not go in. We stop at the steps, clumped holding our hats between our lax hands in front or behind, standing with one foot advanced and our heads lowered, looking aside, down at our hats in our hands and at the earth or now and then at the sky and at one another's grave, composed face. The song ends, the voices quaver away with a rich and dying fall. Whitfield begins. His voice in bigger than him. It's like they are not the same. It's like he is one, and his voice is one swimming on two horses side by side across the ford and coming into the house, the mud splashed one and the one that never even got wet, triumphant and sad. Somebody in the house begins to cry. It sounds like her eyes and her voice were turned back inside her, listening, we move, shifting to the other leg, meeting one another's eye and making like they hadn't touched. Whitfield stops at last. The women sing again. 
In the thick air it's like their voices come out of the air, flowing together and on in the sad, comforting tunes, when they cease it's like they hadn't gone away. It's like they had just disappeared into the air and when we moved we would loose them again out of the air around us, sad and comforting. Then they finish and we put on our hats, our movements stiff, like we hadn't never wore hats before. On the way home Cora is still singing. I am bounding toward my God and my reward. She sings, sitting on the wagon, the shawl around her shoulder and the umbrella open over her, though it is not raining. She has hern, I say. Wherever she went, she has her reward in being free of Aunt's Bundarin. She laid there three days in that box, waiting for Darl and Jewel to come clean back home and get a new wheel and go back to where the wagon was in the ditch. Take my team, Aunt's, I said. We'll wait for ours. She'll want it so. She was ever a particular woman. On the third day they got back and they loaded her into the wagon and started and it already too late. You'll have to go all the way round by Samson's Bridge. It'll take you a day to get there. Then you'll be forty miles from Jefferson. Take my team, Ants. We'll wait for ours. She'll want it so. It was about a mile from the house we saw him, sitting on the edge of the slough. It hadn't had a fish in it never that I knowed. He looked around at us, his eyes round and calm, his face dirty, the pole across his knees. Cora was still singing. This ain't no good day to fish I said. You come on home with us and me and you'll go down to the river first thing in the morning and catch some fish. It's one in here. Dewey Dell seen it. You come on with us. The river's the best place. It's in here. Dewey Dell seen it. I'm bounding toward my God and my reward. It's not your horse that's dead, Jewel, I say. He sits erect on the seat, leaning a little forward, wooden-backed. The brim of his hat has soaked free of the crown in two places, drooping across his wooden face so that, head lowered, he looks through it like through the visor of a helmet, looking long across the valley to where the barn leans against the bluff, shaping the invisible horse. See them, I say. High above the house, against the quick, thick sky, they hang in narrowing circles. From here they are no more than specks, implacable, patient, portentous. But it's not your horse that's dead. God damn you. God damn you. I cannot love my mother because I have no mother. Jewel's mother is a horse. Motionless, the tall buzzards hang in soaring circles, the clouds giving them an illusion of retrograde. Motionless, wooden-backed, wooden-faced, he shapes the horse in a rigid stoop like a hawk, hook-winged. They are waiting for us, ready for the moving of it, waiting for him. He enters the stall and waits until it kicks at him so that he can slip past and mount onto the trough and pause, peering out across the intervening stall tops toward the empty path, before he reaches into the loft. God damn him! God damn him! It won't balance! If you wanted to tote and ride on a balance, we will have. Pick up. God damn you, pick up. I'm telling you it won't tote and it won't ride on a balance unless. Pick up. Pick up. God damn your thick nosed soul to hell. Pick up. It won't balance. If they wanted to tote and ride on a balance, they will. Have. He stoops among us above it, two of the eight hands. In his face the blood goes in waves. In between them his flesh is greenish looking, about that smooth, thick, pale green of cow's cud. His face suffocated, furious, his lip lifted upon his teeth. Pick up! Pick up! God damn your thick-nosed soul! He heaves, lifting one whole side so suddenly that we all spring into the lift to catch and balance it before he hurls it completely over. For an instant it resists, as though volitional, as though within it her pole-thin body clings furiously, even though dead, to a sort of modesty, as she would have tried to conceal a soiled garment that she could not prevent her body soiling. Then it breaks free, 
rising suddenly as though the emaciation of her body had added buoyancy to the planks, or as though, seeing that the garment was about to be torn from her, she rushes suddenly after it in a passionate reversal that flouts its own desire and need. Jules' face goes completely green, and I can hear teeth in his breath. We carry it down the hall, our feet harsh and clumsy on the floor, moving with shuffling steps and through the door. Steady it a minute, now. Pa says, letting go. He turns back to shut and lock the door, but Jewel will not wait. Come on. He says in that suffocating voice. Come on. We lower it carefully down the steps. We move, balancing it as though it were something infinitely precious, our faces averted, breathing through our teeth to keep our nostrils closed. We go down the path, toward the slope. We better wait. I tell you it ain't balanced now. We'll need another hand on that hill. Then turn loose. He will not stop. Cash begins to fall behind, hobbling to keep up, breathing harshly. Then he is distanced, and Jewel carries the entire front end alone, so that, tilting as the path begins to slant, it begins to rush away from me and slip down the air like a sled upon invisible snow, smoothly evacuating atmosphere in which the sense of it is still shaped. Wait, Jewel, I say, but he will not wait. He is almost running now, and Cash is left behind. It seems to me that the end which I now carry alone has no weight, as though it coasts like a rushing straw upon the furious tide of Jewel's despair. I am not even touching it when, turning, he lets it overshoot him, swinging, and stops it and sloughs it into the wagon bed in the same motion and looks back at me, his face suffused with fury and despair. God damn you! God damn you! We are going to town. Dewey Dell says it won't be sold because it belongs to Santa Claus and he'd taken it back with him until next Christmas. Then it will be behind the glass again, shining with waiting. Pa and Cash are coming down the hill, but Jewel is going to the barn. Jewel. Jewel does not stop. Where you going? But Jewel does not stop. You leave that horse here. Jewel stops and looks at Pa. Jewel's eyes look like marbles. You leave that horse here. We'll all go in the wagon with Ma, like she wanted. But my mother is a fish. Vernon seen it. He was there. Jewel's mother is a horse. Then mine can be a fish, can't it, Darl? Jewel is my brother. Then mine will have to be a horse, too. Why? If Pa is your Pa, why does your Ma have to be a horse just because Jewel's is? Why does it? Why does it, Darl? Darl is my brother. Then what is your Ma, Darl? I said. I haven't got one, because if I had one, it is was, and if it is was, it can't be is, can it? No. Then I am not, am I? No, I am. Darl is my brother. But you are, Darl. I know it, that's why I am not is, are as too many for one woman to foal. Cash is carrying his toolbox. Paul looks at him. I'll stop at tolls on the way back. Get on that barn roof. It ain't respectful. It's a deliberate flouting of her and of me. Do you want him to come all the way back here and carry them up to tolls afoot? Paul looks at Darl. His mouth chewing. Pa shaves every day now because my mother is a fish. It ain't right. Dewey Dale has the package in her hand. She has the basket with our dinner too. What's that? Mrs. Toll's cakes. Dewey Dale says, getting into the wagon. I'm taking them to town for her. It ain't right. It's a flouting of the dead. It'll be there. It'll be there come Christmas, she says, shining on the track. She says he won't sell it to no town boys. He goes on toward the barn, entering the lot, wooden-backed. Dewey Dell carries the basket on one arm, in the other hand something wrapped square in a newspaper. Her face is calm and sullen, her eyes brooding and alert. Within them I can see Peabody's back like two round peas in two thimbles. Perhaps in Peabody's back two of those worms which work surreptitious and steady through you and out the other side, and you waking suddenly from sleep or from waking. 
with on your face an expression sudden, intent, and concerned. She sets the basket into the wagon and climbs in, her leg coming long from beneath her tightening dress, that lever which moves the world, one of that caliper which measures the length and breadth of life. She sits on the seat beside Vardaman and sets the parcel on her lap. Then he enters the barn. He has not looked back. It ain't right. It's little enough for him to do for her. Go on. Leave him stay if he wants. He'll be all right here. Maybe he'll go up to Tulls and stay. He'll catch us. He'll cut across and meet us at Tulls Lane. You would have rid that horse too if I hadn't have stopped him. A dern spotted critter wilder than a caddy mount. A deliberate flouting of her and of me. The wagon moves. The mule's ears begin to bob. Behind us, above the house, motionless and tall in soaring circles, they diminish and disappear. I told him not to bring that horse out of respect for his dead ma, because it wouldn't look right, him prancing along on a darn circus animal and her wanting us all to be in the wagon with her that sprung from her flesh and blood, but we hadn't no more than passed tough slain when Darl begun to laugh. Setting back there on the plank seat with Cash, with his dead ma laying in her coffin at his feet, laughing. How many times I told him if doing such things as that that makes folks talk about him, I don't know. I says I got some regard for what folks says about my flesh and blood even if you haven't, even if I have raised such a darn passel of boys, and when you fixes it so folks can say such about you, it's a reflection on your ma, I says, not me. I am a man and I can stand it. It's on your women folks, your ma and sister that you should care for. And I turned and looked back at him and him sitting there, laughing. I don't expect you to have no respect for me, I says. But with your own ma not cold in her coffin yet. Yonder, Cash says, jerking his head toward the lane. The horse is still a right smart piece away, coming up at a good pace, but I don't have to be told who it is. I just looked back at Darl, sitting there laughing. I done my best, I says. I tried to do as she would wish it. The Lord will pardon me and excuse the conduct of them he sent me. And Darl sitting on the plank seat right above her where she was laying, laughing. He comes up the lane fast, yet we are three hundred yards beyond the mouth of it when he turns into the road, the mud flying beneath the flicking drive of the hooves. Then he slows a little, light and erect in the saddle, the horse mincing through the mud. Tull is in his lot. He looks at us, lifts his hand. We go on, the wagon creaking, the mud whispering on the wheels. Vernon still stands there. He watches Jewel as he passes, the horse moving with a light, High need driving gate, three hundred yards back. We go on with a motion so soporific, so dreamlike as to be uninferent of progress, as though time and not space were decreasing between us and it. It turns off at right angles, the wheel marts of last Sunday healed away now, a smooth red scoriation curving away into the pines, a white signboard with faded lettering, New Hope Church, three miles. It wheels up like a motionless hand lifted above the profound desolation of the ocean, Beyond it, the red road lies like a spoke of which Addy Bundren is the rim. It wheels past, empty, unscarred. The white signboard turns away, its fading and tranquil assertion. Cash looks lip the road quietly, his bead turning as we pass, it like an owl's head, his face composed. Pa looks straight ahead, humped. Dewey Dell looks at the road too. Then she looks back at me, her eyes watchful and repudiant, not like that question which was in those of Cash for a smoldering while. The signboard passes, the unscarred road wheels on. Then Dewey Dell turns her head. The wagon creaks on. Cash spits over the wheel. In a couple of days, now it'll be smelling. You might tell Jewel that I say. He is motionless now, sitting the horse at the function, upright, watching us, no less still than the signboard that lifts its fading capitulation opposite him. It ain't balanced right for no long ride. Tell him that too, I say. The wagon creaks on. A mile further along he passes us, 
the horse, arch-necked, reined back to a swift single foot. He sits lightly, poised, upright, wooden-faced in the saddle, the broken hat raked at a swaggering angle. He passes us swiftly without looking at us, the horse driving, its hooves hissing in the mud. A gout of mud, back-flung, plops onto the box. Cash leans forward and takes a tool from his box and removes it carefully. When the road crosses Whiteleaf, the willows leaning near enough, he breaks off a branch and scours at the stain with the wet leaves. It's a hard country, young man. It's hard. Eight miles of the sweat of his body washed up out in the Lord's earth, where the Lord himself told him to put it. Nowhere in this sinful world can honest, hard-working man profit. It takes them that runs the stores in the towns, doing no sweating, living off of them that sweats. It ain't the hard-working man, the farmer. Sometimes I wonder why we keep at it. It's because there is a reward for us above, where they can't take their autos and such. Every man will be equal there, and it will be taken from them that have and give to them that have not by the Lord. But it's a long wait, seems like. It's bad that a fellow must earn the reward of his right doing by flouting himself and his dead. We drove all the rest of the day and got to Samson's at dusk dark, and then that bridge was gone, too. They hadn't never see the river so high, and had not done raining yet there was old men that hadn't never seen nor hear of it being so in the memory of man. I am the chosen of the Lord, for who he loveth, so doeth he chastiseth. But I be darned if he don't take some curious ways to show it, seems like. But now I can get them teeth. That will be a comfort. It will. It was just before sundown. We were sitting on the porch when the wagon came up the road with the five of them in it and the other one on the horse behind. One of them raised his hand, but they was going on past the store without stopping. Who's that? McCallum says, I can't think of his name, Rate's twin, that one it was. It's Bundren, from down beyond New Hope. There's one of them Snopes horses Jewels riding. I didn't know there was arrow one of them horses left. I thought you folks down there finally contrived to give them all away. Try and get that one. The wagon went on. I bet old man Lon never gave it to him. No. He bought it from Pappy. The wagon went on. They must not have heard about the bridge. What are they doing up here anyway? Taking a holiday since he got his wife buried, I reckon. Heading for town I reckon, with Tull's bridge gone too. I wonder if they ain't heard about the bridge. They'll have to fly, then I says. I don't reckon there's a bridge between here and mouth of Ashadawa. They had something in the wagon. But Quick had been to the funeral three days ago and we naturally never thought anything about it except that they were heading away from home mighty late and that they hadn't heard about the bridge. You better holler at them. Dern it, the name is right on the tip of my tongue. So Quick hollered and they stopped and he went to the wagon. And told them. He come back with them. They're going to Jefferson. The bridge at Tulls is gone too. Like we didn't know it, and his face looked funny, around the nostrils, but they just sat there, Bundren and the girl and the chap on the seat, and Cash, and the second one, the one folks talks about, on a plank across the tailgate, and the other one on that spotted horse. But I reckon they was used to it by then, because when I said to Cash that they'd have to pass by New Hope again and what they'd better do, he just says, I reckon we can get there. I ain't much for meddling. Let every man run his own business to suit himself, I say. But after I talked to Rachel about them not having a regular man to fix her and it being July and all, I went back down to the barn and tried to talk to Bundren about it. I give her my promise. Her mind was set on it. I notice how it takes a lazy man, a man that hates moving, to get set on moving once he does get started off, the same as he was set on staying still, like it ain't the moving he hates so much as the starting and the stopping and like he would be kind of proud of whatever come up to make the moving or the setting still look hard. He sat there on the wagon, hunched up, blinking, 
listening to us tell about how quick the bridge went and how high the water was, and I be dern if he didn't act like he was proud of it, like he had made the river rise himself. You say it's higher than you ever see it before? Gods will be done. I reckon it won't go down much by morning neither. You better stay here tonight I says, and get a early start for new hope tomorrow morning. I was just sorry for them bone gaunt mules. I told Rachel, I says, well, would you have had me turn them away at dark, eight miles from home? What else could I do? It won't be but one night, and they'll keep it in the barn, and they'll surely get started by daylight. And so I says, you stay here tonight and early tomorrow you can go back to New Hope. I got tools enough, and the boys can go on right after supper and have it dug and ready if they want, and then I found that girl watching me. If her eyes had a been pistols, I wouldn't be talking now. I'd be dog if they didn't blaze at me. And so when I went down to the barn I come on them, her talking so she never noticed when I come up. You promised her. She wouldn't go until you promised. She thought she could depend on you. If you don't do it, it will be a curse on you. Can't no man say I don't aim to keep my word. My heart is open to error, man. I don't care what your heart is. She was whispering, kind of, talking fast. You promised her. You've got to. You. Then she seen me and quit, standing there. If they'd been pistols, I wouldn't be talking now. So when I talk to him about it, he says. I give her my promise. Her mind is set on it. But seems to me she'd rather have her ma buried close by, so she could. It's Addie I give the promise to. Her mind is set on it. So I told them to drive it into the barn because it was threatening rain again, and that supper was about ready. Only they didn't want to come in. I thank you. We wouldn't discommode you. We got a little something in the basket. We can make out. Well I says, since you are so particular about your women folks, I am too. And when folks stops with us at meal time and won't come to the table, my wife takes it as an insult. So the girl went on to the kitchen to help Rachel. And then Jewel come to me. Sure. Help yourself out in the loft. Feed him when you bait the mules. i rather pay you for him. What for? I wouldn't begrudge no man a bait for his horse. i rather pay you. I thought he said extra. Extra for what? Won't he eat hay and corn? Extra feed. I feed him a little extra and I don't want him beholden to no man. You can't buy no feed from me, boy. And if he can eat that loft clean, I'll help you load the ham onto the wagon in the morning. He ain't never been beholden to no man. i rather pay you for it. And if I had my rathers, you wouldn't be here at all, I wanted to say. But I just says, then it's high time he commenced. You can't buy no feed from me. When Rachel put supper on, her and the girl went and fixed some beds. But wouldn't any of them come in? She's been dead long enough to get over that sort of foolishness. Because I got just as much respect for the dead as e'er a man, but you've got to respect the dead themselves, and a woman that's been dead in a box four days, the best way to respect her is to get her into the ground as quick as you can. But they wouldn't do it. It wouldn't be right. Course, if the boys wants to go to bed... I reckon I can set up with her. I don't begrudge her it. So when I went back down there they were squatting on the ground around the wagon, all of them. Let that chap come to the house and get some sleep. Anyway. And you better come too, I says to the girl. I wasn't aiming to interfere with them. And I surely hadn't done nothing to her that I knowed. He's done already asleep. They had done put him to bed in the trough in an empty stall. Well, you come on, then I says to her. But still she never said nothing. They just squatted there. You couldn't hardly see them. How about you? Boys? You got a full day tomorrow. After a while Cash says, I thank you. We can make out. We wouldn't be behold. I thank you kindly. So I left them squatting there. I reckon after four days they was used to it. But Rachel wasn't. It's outrage. 
a outrage. What could he have done? He give her his promised word. Who's talking about him? Who cares about him? She says, crying. I just wish that you and him and all the men in the world that torture us alive and flout us dead, dragging us up and down the country. Now, now, you're upset. Don't you touch me. Don't you touch me. A man can't tell nothing about them. I lived with the same one fifteen years and I be dern if I can. And I imagined a lot of things coming up between us, but I be dern if I ever thought it would be a body four days dead and that a woman. But they make life hard on them, not taking it as it comes up, like a man does. So I laid there, hearing it commence to rain, thinking about them down there, squatting around the wagon and the rain on the roof, and thinking about Rachel crying there until after a while it was like I could still hear her crying even after she was asleep, and smelling it even when I knowed I couldn't. I couldn't decide even then whether I could or not, or if it wasn't just knowing it was what it was. So next morning I never went down there. I heard them hitching up and then when I knowed they must be about ready to take out, I went out the front and went down the road toward the bridge until I heard the wagon come out of the lot and go back toward New Hope. And then when I come back to the house, Rachel jumped on me because I wasn't there to make them come in to breakfast. You can't tell about them. Just about when you decide they mean one tiling, I be dern if you not only haven't got to change your mind, like as not you got to take a rawhiding for thinking they meant it. But it was still like I could smell it. And so I decided then that it wasn't smelling it, but it was just knowing it was there, like you will get fooled now and then. But when I went to the barn I knew different when I walked into the hallway I saw something. It kind of hunkered up when I come in and I thought at first it was one of them got left, then I saw what it was. It was a buzzard. It looked around and saw me and went on down the hall, spraddle-legged, with its wings kind of hunkered out, watching me first over one shoulder and then over the other, like a old bald-headed man. When it got outdoors it begun to fly. It had to fly a long time before it ever got up into the air, with it thick and heavy and full of rain like it was. If they was bent on going to Jefferson, I reckon they could have gone around up by Mount Vernon, like McCallum did. He'll get home about day after tomorrow, horseback. Then they'd be just eighteen miles from town. But maybe this bridge being gone too has learned him the Lord's sense and judgment. That McCallum. He's been trading with me off and on for twelve years. I have known him from a boy up, know his name as well as I do my own. But be dern if I can say it. The signboard comes in sight. It is looking out at the road now, because it can wait. New hope. Three miles. It will say. New hope. Three miles. New hope. Three miles. And then the road will begin, curving away into the trees, empty with waiting, saying new hope three miles. I heard that my mother is dead. I wish I had time to let her die. I wish I had time to wish I had. It is because in the wild and outraged earth too soon too soon too soon. It's not that I wouldn't and will not it's that it is too soon too soon too soon. Now it begins to say it. New hope three miles. New hope three miles. That's what they mean by the womb of time the agony and the despair of spreading bones, the hard girdle in which lie the outraged entrails of events. Cash's head turns slowly as we approach, his pale empty sad composed and questioning face following the red and empty curve, beside the bade will jewel sits the horse, gazing straight ahead. The land runs out of Darl's eyes, they swim to pinpoints. They begin at my feet and rise along my body to my face, and then my dress is gone, I sit naked on the seat above the unhurrying mules, above the travail. Suppose I tell him to turn. He will do what I say. Don't you know he will do what I say? Once I waked with a black void rushing under me. I could not see. I saw Vardaman rise and go to the window and strike the knife into the fish, the blood gushing hissing like steam but I could not see. He'll do as I say. He always does. 
I can persuade him to anything. You know I can. Suppose I say turn here. That was when I died that time. Suppose I do. We'll go to New Hope. We won't have to go to town. I rose and took the knife from the streaming fish still hissing and I killed Doral. When I used to sleep with Vardaman I had a nightmare once I thought I was awake but I couldn't see and couldn't feel I couldn't feel the bed under me and I couldn't think what I was I couldn't think of my name I couldn't even think I am a girl I couldn't even think I nor even think I want to wake up nor remember what was opposite to awake so I could do that I knew that something was passing but I couldn't even think of time then all of a sudden I knew that something was it was wind blowing over me it was like the wind came and blew me back from where it was I was not blowing the room and Vardaman asleep and all of them back, under me again and going on like a piece of cool silk dragging across my naked legs. It blows cool out of the pines, a sad steady sound. New hope. Was three miles. Was three miles. I believe in God, I believe in God. Why didn't we go to New Hope, Pa? Mr. Samson said we was, but we done passed the road. Look, Jewel. But he is not looking at me. He is looking at the sky. He buzzard is as still as if he were nailed to it. We turn into Toll's Lane. We pass the barn and go on, the wheels whispering in the mud, passing the green rows of cotton in the wild earth, and Vernon Little across the field behind the plow. He lifts his hand as we pass and stands there looking after us for a long while. Look, Jewel. Jewel sits on his horse like they were both made out of wood, looking straight ahead. I believe in God, God. God, I believe in God. After they passed I taken the mule out and looped up the trace chains and followed. They was setting in the wagon at the end of the levee when I caught up with them. Ants was setting there, looking at the bridge where it was swagged down into the river with just the two ends in sight. He was looking at it like he had believed all the time that folks had been lying to him about it being gone, but like he was hoping all the time it really was. Kind of pleased astonishment he looked, setting on the wagon in his Sunday pants, mumbling his mouth. Looking like a uncurried horse dressed up, I don't know. The boy was watching the bridge where it was mid-sunk and logs and such drifted up over it and it swagging and shivering like the whole thing would go any minute, big-eyed he was watching it, like he was to a circus. And the gal too. When I come up she looked around at me, her eyes kind of blaring up and going hard like I had made to touch her. Then she looked at ants again and then back at the water again. It was nigh up to the levee on both sides, the earth hid except for the tongue of it we was on going out to the bridge and then down into the water and except for knowing how the road and the bridge used to look, a fellow couldn't tell where was the river and where the land. It was just a tangle of yellow and the levee not less wider than a knife back land of, with us setting in the wagon and on the horse and the mule. Darl was looking at me, and then Cash turned and looked at me with that look in his eyes like when he was figuring on whether the planks would fit her that night, like he was measuring them inside of him and not asking you to say what you thought and not even letting on he was listening if you did say it but listening all right. Jewel hadn't moved. He sat there on the horse, leaning a little forward, with that same look on his face when him and Darrell passed the house yesterday, coming back to get her. If it was just up, we could drive across. We could drive right on across it. Sometimes a log would get shoved over the jam and float on, rolling and turning, and we could watch it go on to where the ford used to be. It would slow up and whirl crossways and hang out of water for a minute and you could tell by that that the ford used to be there. But that don't show nothing I say. It could be a bar of quicksand built up there. We watch the log. Then the gal is looking at me again. Mr. Whitfield crossed it. He was horseback. And three days ago. It's riz five foot since. If the bridge was just up. The log bobs up and goes on again. There is a lot of trash in foam, and you can hear the water. But it's down. A careful fellow could walk across yonder on the planks and logs. But you couldn't tote nothing I say. Likely time you set foot on that mess, it'll all go, too. What you think, Daro? He is looking at me. He don't say nothing, just looks at me with them queer eyes of his and that makes folks talk. 
I always say it ain't never been what he done so much or said or anything so much as how he looks at you. It's like he had got into the inside of you, some way. Like somehow you was looking at yourself and your doings out of his eyes. Then I can feel that gal watching me like I had made to touch her. She says something to ants. Mr. Whitfield. I give her my promised word in the presence of the Lord. I reckon it ain't no need to worry. But still he does not start the mules. We set there above the water. Another log bobs up over the jam and goes on. We watch it check up and swing slow for a minute where the ford used to be. Then it goes on. It might start falling tonight I say. You could lay over one more day. Then Joel turns sideways on the horse. He has not moved until then, and he turns and looks at me. His face is kind of green, then it would go red and then green again. Get to hell on back to your damn plowin. Who the hell asked you to follow us here? I never meant no harm. Shut up, Jewel. Cash says. Jewel looks back at the water, his face gritted, going red and green and then red. Well, Cash says after a while. What you want to do? Ants don't say nothing. He sets humped up, mumbling his mouth. If it was just up, we could drive across it. Come on, Jewel says, moving the horse. Wait, Cash says. He looks at the bridge. We look at him, except Ants and the gal. They are looking at the water. Dewey Dell and Vardaman and Pa better walk across on the bridge. Vernon can help them. And we can hitch his mule ahead of our own. You ain't going to take my mule into that water I say. Jewel looks at me. His eyes look like pieces of a broken plate. I'll pay for your damn mule. I'll buy it from you right now. My mule ain't going into that water. Jewel's gonna use his horse. Why won't you risk your mule, Vernon? Shut up, Darl. You and Jewel both. My mule ain't going into that water. He sits the horse, glaring at Vernon, his lean face suffused up to and beyond the pale rigidity of his eyes. The summer when he was fifteen, he took a spell of sleeping. One morning when I went to feed the mules, the cows were still in the tie-up, and then I heard Pa go back to the house and call him. When we came on back to the house for breakfast, he passed us, carrying the milk buckets, stumbling along like he was drunk, and he was milking when we put the mules in and went on to the field without him. We had been there an hour, and still he never showed up. When Dewey Dell came with our lunch, Pa sent her back to find Jewel. They found him in the tie-up, sitting on the stool, asleep. After that, every morning, Pa would go in and wake him. He would go to sleep at Di's supper table, and soon as supper was finished, he would go to bed, and when I came into bed, he would be lying there like a dead man. Yet still, Pa would have to wake him in the morning. He would get up, but he wouldn't hardly have half sense. He would stand for Pa's jawing and complaining without a word, and take the milk buckets and go to the barn. And once I found him asleep at the cow, the bucket in place and half full, and his hands up to the wrists in the milk, and his head against the cow's flank. After that, Dewey Dell had to do the milking. He still got up when Pa waked him, going about what we told him to do in that dazed way. It was like he was trying hard to do them, that he was as puzzled as anyone else. Are you sick? Don't you feel all right? Yes. I feel all right. He's just lazy. Trying me. Pa said, and Jewel standing there, asleep on his feet like as not. Ain't you? He said, waking Jewel up again to answer. No. You take off and stay in the house today. With that whole bottom piece to be busted out? If you ain't sick, what's the matter with you? Nothing. I'm all right. All right? You're asleep on your feet this minute. No. I'm all right. I want him to stay at home today. I'll need him. It's tight enough with all of us to do it. You'll just have to do the best you can with Cash and Darl. I want him to stay in today. But he wouldn't do it. I'm all right. He said, going on. But he wasn't all right. Anybody could see it. He was losing flesh, and I have seen him go to sleep chopping, 
watched the hoe going slower and slower up and down with less and less of an arc until it stopped and he leaning on it motionless in the hot shimmer of the sun. Ma wanted to get the doctor, but Pa didn't want to spend the money without it was needful. And Jewel did seem all right, except for his thinness and his way of dropping off to sleep at any moment. He ate hearty enough, except for his way of going to sleep in his plate, with a piece of bread halfway to his mouth and his jaws still chewing. But he swore he was all right. It was Ma that got Dewey Dell to do his milking, paid her somehow. And the other jobs around the house that Jewel had been doing before supper, she found some way for Dewey Dell and Vardaman to do them, and doing them herself when Pa wasn't there. She would fix him special things to eat and hide them for him. And that may have been when I first found it out, that Addie Bundren should be hiding anything she did, who had tried to teach us that deceit was such that, in a world where it was, nothing else could be very bad or very important, not even poverty, and at times when I went in to go to bed, she would be sitting in the dark by Jewel, where he was asleep. And I knew that she was hating herself for that deceit and hating Jewel because she had to love him so that she had to act the deceit. One night she was taken sick, and when I went to the barn to put the team in and drive to Tulls, I couldn't find the lantern. I remembered noticing it on the nail the night before, but it wasn't there now at midnight. So I hitched in the dark and went on and came back with Mrs. Tull just after daylight, and there the lantern was, hanging on the nail where I remembered it and couldn't find it before. And then one morning while Dewey Dell was milking just before sunup, Jewel came into the barn from the back, through the hole in the back wall, with the lantern in his hand. I told Cash, and Cash and I looked at one another. Rutting. Yes, but why the lantern, and every night too? No wonder he's losing flesh. Are you going to say anything to him? Won't do any good. What he's doing now won't do any good either. I know. But he'll have to learn that himself. Give him time to realize that it'll save, that there'll be just as much more tomorrow, and he'll be all right. I wouldn't tell anybody, I reckon. No, I told Dewey Dell not to, not Ma anyway. No. Not Ma. After that, I thought it was right comical. He acting so bewildered and willing and dead for sleep and gaunt as a beanpole and thinking he was so smart with it. And I wondered who the girl was. I thought of all I knew that it might be, but I couldn't say for sure. Taint any girl. It's a married woman somewhere. Ain't any young girl got that much daring and staying power. That's what I don't like about it. Why, I said. She'll be safer for him than a girl would. More judgment. He looked at me, his eyes fumbling, the words fumbling at what he was trying to say. It ain't always the safe things in this world that a fellow... You mean, the safe things are not always the best things? Aye. Best. He said, fumbling again. It ain't the best things, the things that are good for him. A young boy. A fellow kind of hates to see, wallowing in somebody else's mire. That's what he was trying to say. When something is new and hard and bright... There ought to be something a little better for it than just being safe. Since the safe things are just the things that folks have been doing so long, they have worn the edges off and there's nothing to the doing of them that leaves a man to say, that was not done before and it cannot be done again. So we didn't tell, not even when after a while he'd appear suddenly in the field beside us and go to work, without having had time to get home and make out he had been in bed all night. He would tell Ma that he hadn't been hungry at breakfast, or that he had eaten a piece of bread while he was hitching up the team. But Cash and I knew that he hadn't been home at all on those nights, and he had come up out of the woods when we got to the field. But we didn't tell. Summer was almost over then. We knew that when the nights began to get cool, she would be done if he wasn't. But when fall came and the nights began to get longer, the only difference was that he would always be in bed for Pa to wake him, getting him up at last in that first state of semi-idiocy like when it first started, worse than when he had stayed out all night. She's sure a stayer, I told Cash. I used to admire her, but I downright respect her now. It ain't a woman. You know, I said, but he was watching me. What is it then? That's what I aim to find out. You can trail him through the woods all night if you want to, I said. 
I'm not. I ain't trailing him. What do you call it, then? I ain't trailing him. I don't mean it that way. And so a few nights later, I heard Jewel get up and climb out the window, and then I heard Cash get up and follow him. The next morning when I went to the barn, Cash was already there, the mules fed, and he was helping Dewey Dell milk. And when I saw him, I knew that he knew what it was. Now and then I would catch him watching Jewel with a queer look, like having found out where Jewel went and what he was doing had given him something to really think about at last. But it was not a worried look. It was the kind of look I would see on him when I would find him doing some of Jewel's work around the house, work that Pa still thought Jewel was doing and that Ma thought Dewey Dell was doing. So I said nothing to him, believing that when he got done digesting it in his mind, he would tell me. But he never did. One morning, it was November then, five months since it started. Jewel was not in bed, and he didn't join us in the field. That was the first time Ma learned anything about what had been going on. She sent Vardaman down to find where Jewel was, and after a while she came down too. It was as though, so long as the deceit ran along, quiet and monotonous, all of us let ourselves be deceived, abetting it unawares or maybe through cowardice, since all people are cowards and naturally prefer any kind of treachery because it has a bland outside. But now it was like we had all, and by a kind of telepathic agreement of admitted fear, flung the whole thing back like covers on the bed, and we all sitting bolt upright in our nakedness, staring at one another, arid, saying, Now is the truth. He hasn't come home. Something has happened to him. We let something happen to him. Then we saw him. He came up along the ditch and then turned straight across the field, riding the horse. Its mane and tail were going, as though in motion they were carrying out the splotchy pattern of its coat. He looked like he was riding on a big pinwheel, bare-hacked, with a rope bridle and no hat on his head. It was a descendant of those Texas ponies Flem Snopes brought here 25 years ago and auctioned off for $2 a head and nobody but old Lon Quick ever caught his and still owned some of the blood because he could never give it away. He galloped up and stopped, his heels in the horse's ribs and it dancing and swirling like the shape of its mane and tail and the splotches of its coat had nothing whatever to do with the flesh and bone horse inside them and he sat there looking at us. Where did you get that horse? Bought it. From Mr. Quick. Bought it? With what? Did you buy that thing on my word? It was my money. I earned it. You won't need to worry about it. Jewel! Jewel! It's all right. He earned the money. He cleaned up that 40 acres of new ground Quick laid out last spring. He did it single-handed working at night by lantern. I saw him. So I don't reckon that horse cost anybody anything except Jewel. I don't reckon we need worry. Jewel. Jewel. You come right to the house and go to bed. Not yet. I ain't got time. I got to get me a saddle and bridle. Mr. Quick says he. Jewel. Ma said looking at him. I'll give. I'll give. Give. Then she began to cry. She cried hard, not hiding her face, standing there in her faded wrapper, looking at him and him on the horse, looking down at her, his face growing cold and a little sick looking, until he looked away quick and Cash came and touched her. You go on to the house. This here ground is too wet for you. You go on, now. She put her hands to her face then and after a while she went on, stumbling a little on the plow marks. But pretty soon she straightened up and went on. She didn't look back. When she reached the ditch, she stopped and called Vardaman. He was looking at the horse, land of dancing up and down by it. Let me ride Jewel. Let me ride Jewel. Jewel looked at him, then he looked away again, holding the horse reined back. Pa watched him, mumbling his lip. So you bought a horse. You went behind my back and bought a horse. You never consulted me. You know how tight it is for us to make by, yet you bought a horse for me to feed. Taken the work from your flesh and blood and bought a horse with it. Jewel looked at Pa, his eyes paler than ever. He won't never eat a mouthful of yours. Not a mouthful. 
I'll kill him first. Don't you never think it. Don't you never. Let me ride, Jewel. Let me ride, Jewel. He sounded like a cricket in the grass, a little one. Let me ride, Jewel. That night I found Ma sitting beside the bed where he was sleeping, in the dark. She cried hard, maybe because she had to cry so quiet. Maybe because she felt the same way about tears she did about deceit, hating herself for doing it, hating him because she had to. And then I knew that I knew. I knew that as plain on that day as I knew about Dewey Dell on that day.